Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's one o'clock here in New York at the Guggenheim. Um, thank you so much for joining me for session two, Keepers of the World Around. Um, for those of us who were um, here for our morning session, it was um, a really kind of lively conversation in the YouTube chat. Um, it was a wonderful town hall. Um, thank you so much for all of your contributions. And it's, um, it's really lovely to see the, uh, the images of the laptops and uh, living rooms around the world um, watching with us today. So hi, and hi to everyone watching on Dizine. Um, thank you so much um, to everyone for participating in today. I'm really happy to be introducing this session. Um, it has some pretty spectacular contributions. Um, we're also going to have two launches, um, so completely new projects will be launching during this session. Um, this is a group of presenters who are concerned with the physical, political, and spiritual agency of the land beneath their feet. Some of them are exploring the relationship to, to the earth, to soil, water, salt, while others are studying the impact of centuries-long territorial occupation and the eradication of traditional vernacular building techniques in indigenous communities. This session considers how the voices, histories, and design ideas of the caretakers of lands might be heard more clearly in the present and future. We're going to start with Francis Carré, who is going to be introducing for the first time the story of the National Assembly in Benin. We'll then go to Ensemble, who will be introducing the Khan Terra, which is the, uh, the image you may have seen um, of a quarry that has turned into their studio and home in Menorca. We're then going to be going to a very special film by Cave Bureau, um, who are based in Nairobi, called the Anthropocene Museum. And then to Weiwei, who are based in Dubai, who will be talking about their project Wetland, which is going to be shown at this year's Venice Architecture Biennale. And then we're going to be screening a documentary, um, which has been made for us by Honest Luca, uh, Mariana Ordi or or Ordones um, Grajales uh, with Indignacion Ace, um, which is a group of um, it's a group of architects who are working with indigenous community in the Yucatan. Um, it's a very special film, and we're looking forward to seeing that. And then finally, we'll have the the debut of um, uh, Yua Nango's um, virtual Girigumpi. Um, that's going to be introduced to us by ArcDes. Um, and so we'll have um, a, a first glimpse at this new project that they're launching today. And then finally, I'm going to be in conversation with one of my favorite, new favorite pe people in the whole wide world, Samaya Valley from Counter Counterspace. Um, so we're going to have a short conversation, and then we're going to invite um, everybody from, uh, from session two to join us in a town hall discussion. So while you're watching, please get your, your questions ready for this um, very special and thoughtful group of designers and architects. I really hope you enjoy it, and um, I'll see you uh, at the town hall. Dear virtual visitors, of the World Around Summit 2021. I am Francis Kere, I'm architect. I was born in Burkina Faso, and now I am working from Berlin, Germany, and from Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, doing projects in many places. I am delighted to have been asked to share what my studio is working on uh, within the framework of architectures now, near, and next. So, I will be speaking on the way a pull from communal living and democratic practices rooted in the West of Africa to shape the way I built and the typology I arrived at. And I will use a project that is shown to start construction and another one that has been completed not long ago as illustration. It has been my experience during my training and my work as architect uh, that contemporary African architecture, broadly speaking, is often seen as being representative of an ideology or economical 
interest imported from the outside. This is especially uh, true for post-colonial public structures, many of which are either mimicking socialist architecture. This is the case when a given country was part of the Soviet-African relation uh, during the, the decolonization uh, process, or they follow Western models by mimicking mid-20th century Eurocentric architecture. To simply highlight the newly found independence, what cannot be found uh, are buildings that reflect indigenous um, form of governance, democratic practices, or a material and climate uh, responsible um, approach and uh, local knowledge. Myself, I started out uh, being led by material and local uh, craftsmanship, you know. So I built my very first building, a school, um, as a student with mud and using rubbers to create a roof structure. I did this because mud is available in my village and rebars can be easily used by the locals to create structures. This was not to serve a political idea, but simply because I wanted to use what is most available and easy to be used by the local people. And the power to push their dream to come true. Now, having built in this way, uh, I have gained um, uh, visibility, uh, potentially also credibility. And now uh, with my structure, we are uh, being approached uh, to design, uh, erect a parliament building in Benin. And it is time to explore the second part of what is missing in contemporary architecture. That is the reflection of West African way of governance. When tasked with designing this public structure, my aim was to uncall the building within an indigenous form of democracy that exists long before colonial times and continue to be uh, practiced in the villages and the countryside of the region. In the case of the National Assembly of Benin, it is the practice of meeting under a tree that guided our design, to come together, to sit and gather and discuss, to find consensus through conversations. The tree under which this happens are known as Arbre a Palabra. Literally, this translates to a tree under which people gather to speak and in the shade of their canopies, summits are held and judgments are passed. There are both town hall and court. And furthermore, there can be classrooms, there can be also um, a temporary market, but there can be a temporary hospital where vaccination campaigns are held. And it was our wish to create an homage to them, a parliament house building that took the tree as the blueprint for its shape and its typology has since emerged. Located in Porto Novo, the political capital of Benin, the building will sit within a large public park, which is part of our design proposal. And this park is next to an, a historical botanical garden with lots of native trees and plants. In this sitting, the National Assembly can be seen 
as the biggest tree of the forest, providing shade for the public. Uh, very often, kapok trees and baobabs are being used as arbor and palabra. They have a very impressive roots that have their very own architectural language. They provide shapes against which the elders can lean or sit, and they also provide different compartments. And this particularity can be found in our design as the trunk of the building is hollow and fit with benches to invite the public to gather in groups. While in the interior, this trunk form a kind of canopy that gives the assembly hall an organic feel and is reminiscent of this gathering in the shade of an actual tree. Our wish was also to adapt the building to particularities of the climate. A double facade keep the glass protected from the sun and the central courtyard is imagined in a way that allows uh, for the air to circulate and create a climate that is inviting to linger. On all aspects, the challenge was to translate the language and design genius of nature within such an enormous building and into a political realm that does have certain etiquettes and security requirements. This is just one example on how um, I am learning from the region where I grew up to inform my design and our architecture. West Africa, especially what is today uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, north of, of Ghana, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria has um, have an amazing example of vernacular architecture. Over centuries, people have created the most beautiful and organic structures um, that are part of their surrounding, almost melting with it. Example of these are mud mosques like the one of Jenny, the clusters of round hat that makes up communal living space in Burkina Faso, the detailed pattern of uh, housing of the Casena in Ghana and Burkina Faso, and the two-story Tata Sumba in Togo uh, and Benin. These are examples of architectural topology that was shaped by an intimate knowledge of climate um, conditions, expertise on available material, and it is informed by how community are organized. This knowledge has been passed from grandmother and grandfather to parent and to children. In this way, architecture is not the job of a single professional, but a shared expertise. This can also be seen in something like the Tuguna. The Tuguna, like the Arbor Apalabra, is a gathering space, but this one is man-made. We wanted to learn from it, to celebrate it, and to spread it into the world. Tugunas are communal gathering huts of what is today Mali and Burkina Faso, especially the, in the part of the region known as Dogan country, where they can still be found in their original form. With slightly adapted version existing across West Africa. They are places of peace of discourse and of calm. And they achieve this through a structure that does not allow 
the individual entering it to stand. With this simple trick, they rid visitors of the ability to get physically aggressive towards one another. We wanted to learn from the Tugana and to design the visitor's pavilion for the Triple Rise Art Center in Montana. The Triple Rise Art Center is an incredible place where very big sculptures are spread far across an impressive landscape with our structure serving as the jumping off point and visitors gathering place. Because it is quite an abstract translation in terms of form, we were much more guided by the design approach the West African builders of the Tugana took in imagining a space that set out to be conductive to a certain kind of dialogue and behavior. And we went a step further with this visitor pavilion. The visitor pavilion is now is called also Xylem. So together with the people who commissioned us, we wanted to create a sort of bound, not to, to, to let it be or to let it by relationship within a client and architect but we wanted to create a strong exchange. You know, thanks to this incredible vision and generosity, Xylem is the symbolic patron saint of the secondary school we are completing in my ho hometown of Gandu this year. This, in turn, makes the continuation of my very first project which was the primary school of Gandu. And so here too, everything is connected. Ladies and gentlemen, 20 years of my architectural structure has put me to a point today where an intricate web is emerging. One that connects the economic proofs, uh, let's say, um, of, the, of the US, uh, with the democratic wisdom of pre-colonial West Africa and in turn supports the people in an economically challenged position like Burkina Faso to learn, be inspired and dream and so build on knowledge that they have inherited uh, with pride. In this way, my architecture has allowed me to reimagine um, who can benefit, how from who. When people as diverse as the actual president of Benin, Mr. Talon, and philanthropist like uh, the maker of the Tipper Rice Art Center, um, Kathy and Peter, uh, command, commission contemporary architecture in the way I just described, then we are creating buildings that allow for dreams that push outside the increasingly monolithic idea of what architecture and democracy needs to look like today. And maybe this way we can contribute to building a public sphere in Africa and beyond that sits within the so-called Afro-futuristic imagination. Of course, uh, these couple of minutes are not near enough to go deep into uh, the points raised. Um, I want to say thank you to the Guggenheim and especially to Beatrice Galilei for allowing me to share these treats of thought that is shaping my architecture now, near, and next. Thank you very much, and see you soon.
My name is uh, Anton Garcia Abril, and I lead with uh, Deborah Mesa Ensemble Studio. In Ensemble Studio, we practice architecture as the communion between art and technology. And I wanted to tell the story of Canterra, starting in this beautiful megalithic construction, in Talayot, the Curniano. Because this is a symbolic, prehistoric architecture that unites all the ideas that we understand are very contemporary. This harmony between human actions and, and uh, the natural. And also is part of Menorca that, as an island, has been protected through the years of these, I would say, contaminations of civilization. The story of Canterra starts here. These stones, I'm sure, that were extracted from the same cuts of the quarry of this beautiful material, Piedra de Mares, that is worked in the island in Pedra Seca, or in big megaliths like in the Talayot, or in squared pieces. And the island is full of these pedreras, old quarries that were the source of the material to build the architecture of the Mediterranean. We're just the contemporary part of this long story and we want to be embedded on it. That's why we we honor the origins of this Talayot uh, that by proximity, by history and also by sensibilities we are deeply connected. Menorca also is a exemplary territory of sensibilities towards environment. It's a reserve of the biosphere. And that's why we understood that this was our place to install our, our heart and our, our laboratory where we could connect Talayot with the cornices of Canterra, the house of the earth, that arise through those cuts of the terrain. The scale of the ancient quarries is small, is integrated, is pretty much domestic due to the tools of excavation that were so rudimentary. And when all this quarrying became an industrial process, all these structures were abandoned until we discover them. A beautiful encounter that where we say that we didn't look for Canterra, Canterra found us to take care of it and to, to give a little renaissance and a, a transformation of, of its human, industrial and natural landscape to be again uh, honored and uh, used through this rustic wall of Piedra de Mares, the background is the source, no? the, the subsoil of Menorca is that stone, limestone, soft, beautiful, workable stone. And uh, this linked us to the place and connected us with the earth of Menorca. Welcome to Canterra. Canterra starts with this passage where you could see here what we found. It was uh, an old pedrera, you know, covered with uh, soil and 
uh, with a lot of spaces that insinuated that something was hidden there, some kind of treasure or, or jewel. And with this kind of beautiful rock formations that obviously are not natural, this is not a cave, we understood that there were layers of soil underneath where I could imagine amazing spaces would be revealed. So that was, that was our act of faith, act of faith in architecture, an act of faith in something that was going to really be an adventure. No? That's the, the cornice of Canterra with the garden. This natural landscape that is uh, part of this organic architecture that fascinated us and in inspired us and invited us to, to take care of it, to, to clean it fundamentally, to reveal the, the different layers of space that were hidden under all those uh, substrates of time and, and, and abandonment. Let me welcome you to the spaces of Canterra, where you will feel the beauty of this materic architecture, where nothing is orthogonal, nothing follows the dogmas and the impositions of geometry, and everything follows just the logic of the natural and also of the actions that were induced to carve it. This beautiful tectonics was the result of an industrial process where the stone was telling the human where to carve. The softer pieces were the ones that gave the path to the space to find itself. And the space is the result of this conjunction of, of uh, material conditions and human actions. So this is not designed. This is just a beautiful piece of architecture that hybridizes our sensibilities as artists and also the discovery through technology of uh, the given space as a fruit of nature. If we travel through it, we try to apply certain aspects of comfort and hygiene to make this cave become a home. What's a home? A home is a place where you feel, where you live, where you are comfortable, where you can share with, with others. So we added very, very little um, um, pieces, no? small parts of furniture, a chimney where we can um, gather and be together. And some aspects of uh, of uh, our uh, our daily necessity, no? of course, uh, but fundamentally, what we what we enjoy here is a, is an amazing scale, a new domesticity, and fundamentally, a new expressiveness of the structures that construct architecture space. The the itineraries and the paths that the plant flows and follows are beautiful, but are given by determined action. There's no architect here, but there's a lot of architecture. And still there's a lot to do. For example, this topography uh, of beautifully sculpted uh, uh, stones has yet to be designed and transformed into something that we have not yet even envisioned. We are giving some time to these stones to tell us what to do with them. We could uh, dream in this corner room that has this beautiful entry of light to have some kind of social space surrounding this void here, but this has not been yet Accomplished. No? So, Cantera will be a life project that Ensemble Studio uh, will, will develop through, through time. 
but it's already a place where we enjoy the living, working, spending a lot of time with uh, our friends, our collaborators. And it certainly is a place that could be considered the house of the earth. Can Terra means the house of the earth. We did create these screens of light. It's not a facade, this is just a screen that captures all the ambient light and filters it in a more abstract, more architectonic substance. And here is where the, the magic of the place really shines, so where a new scale is given and small details transform this into a, into a home. Uh, the home requires very little with this column. But every home needs a garden. This is our secret garden where all the symbols of Canterra are condensed in this first and last stone that symbolizes the human actions, the harmony, the the physics and the technology that space requires, and ultimately, the beauty that we have revealed. And as architects, as, as artists, we have recovered, we have reconstructed, just by cleaning, just by reinterpreting, just by silently taking care of the place. Uh, Canterra for, for us, for Ensemble Studio, for Deborah Mesa, for, for Borja Soriano, for Claudia Armas, for everybody that has been leading this transformation is part of our life. It's not a job, it's not a project. It's, it's us. We want this to be us. And this is the, I would say, the spiritual connection that we do have with the earth. It's, it's something that transcends the, the, the standard boundaries of disciplinary architecture and becomes part of our Caves as habitable spaces and structures are nature's manifestation of a museum. And this is by virtue of the fact that on their walls and within their spaces are moments of cultural and historical importance. We believe that experiencing these caves that geologically date back millions of years is a celebration of our rich architectural heritage of cave inhabitation by our early and more recent ancestors across the planet. Their footprints stretch as far back as a quarter of a million years ago. Our geologically recent histories and theories of architecture have inadequately framed this canon as such, just as we reflect on the origin of our early experiences of what it was like to be inside and out to see light wells, to hear echoes, among other qualities that are today ingrained in our prehistoric consciousness. I'm Stella Motegi, an architect, founder and director at Cave Bureau, which is an architectural firm that does research as well, based in Nairobi, Kenya. 
My name is Kabage Karanja, also an architect uh, based in Nairobi, Kenya, both a founder and director of Cave Bureau. We are on location at uh, Kisima Cave, which is part of the three giant sister caves, a series of caves here in Swaka, which is in Kwale County. This sequence of caves connect up to the Shimoni Caves along the Indian Ocean coast. The Shimoni Caves are quite a significant historical set of caves. A lot of people don't know that there was actually a lot of slavery on the East African coast. The world knows a lot about the West African transatlantic slave trade, but little is known and little is documented on the East African the Shimoni Caves and the caves that we are in at the moment. You have the Shimoni Caves that were used to hold slaves before they were shipped off to, to the Middle East. And then we have the three giant sister caves where there were caves of refuge for many communities between three tribes. And the tribe that had settled closer to these caves, anytime they were attacked, they would hide in the caves and get refuge from the attackers. And sometimes from the tunnel, you'd have slaves that had escaped and would run through the tunnels and find a place of refuge. So that was quite interesting that depending on which side of the tunnel you are traveling towards, you either found safety or you found great, great danger. It is no coincidence that the proposed Anthropocene is believed to have formally begun from the middle of the 20th century, which coincides with the gestation and operation of many anti-colonial movements around the world. So it goes without saying that the discourse surrounding the Anthropocene has been dominated by a Eurocentric perspective and gaze with very little focus on the African voice in the sciences and the social sciences regarding the nature of this new geological epoch. So the fact of the matter is that this epoch was very much arrived at through a long history of exploitation and subjugation of non-European people to exploit the earth and grow economies, which in many ways still continues today. At Cave, we categorize the city into three bits, and we name them the origin, the void, and the maid. The origin is really your rural areas. Kabage and myself, our generation, our parents were born during the colonial struggle. And when we gained independence, a lot of them mostly lived outside of Nairobi. Then they moved to urban centers, got jobs there, and within the urban centers, they further classified into the void and the maid. Colonialism fundamentally created a shift in our cultures, our societies, which brought in an aspiration which was very foreign and not owned by us, but a picture that we needed to follow to create a city and a new city for that. But it was very problematic because within the city you find today, there is the void. And we call that the void for a very good reason because it's a very complex territory which is, is troubled in many respects 
it is classified as slum spaces, informal settlements, neglected neighborhoods, and these represent large communities that dwell within these spaces, the majority of city dwellers, who aspire to live within the maid, which is the more affluent, the more pristine environment. But all these territories are in a state of dysfunction. So our manifesto tries to analyze and dissect uh, moments within the spaces to bring them together. We believe that humanity is returning back to the caves. And the reason for that is we have affected our natural systems and ecosystems that actually sustain life on Earth. And those pressures are resulting in, in many crises, one of which we're in right now, the pandemic, which is as a result of our close proximity to nature, our consumption of nature, and our ability to overcome it in a detrimental way. And this is hurtling us back towards uh, our original state which unfortunately um, would result in many people dying, many people losing their homes. And we are in a situation right now which is fundamentally critical. And one of the key things we try to do is speak to the local communities uh, who have a strong hold over their environment, but their communities who tend to be very much marginalized and lost across the seams. And our intention is to give them a voice and hear what they believe about the environment, what they believe their history is, their present, and hopefully their future. And in that regard, that is what has brought us here uh, to speak with with many community members about specifically here, the caves. Our Anthropocene Museum project is a conceptual study, but one that we believe is also grounded on fact. Museum for the very reason that we believe the Africans need to redefine what a museum is, an age old institution that has its history, but within Africa, it has been very much borrowed. So we bring the question at the front while thinking about the Anthropocene. Our Anthropocene Museum curation number one, which was in Suswa Caves, which is a network that is located within the Rift Valley. It's a volcanic cave with geothermal activity and we found after discussion with the community that geothermal extraction is done in a very unsustainable way without the full cooperation, if you would say, with the community and engagement with the community, which has resulted in marginalization, resulted in feelings of disgruntlement of how the government have treated them without giving them enough agency to question what is being brought forward into these proposals. Here in Anthropocene Curation 2.0, we came to the Shimoni Caves to look at the history of Shimoni. Equally, we'll be zooming in a bit closer to look into the slave caves from an architectural perspective, the scale of the cave the sort of environment, the life, flora and fauna. The philosopher and psychiatrist, Franz Fanon said, the Marxist analysis should always be slightly stretched every time we look at the colonial problem. We think equally that the Anthropocene analysis should always be slightly stretched every time we look at the colonial problem. So here at the Anthropocene Museum, we revisit this context 
although with more sophisticated tools, to grow a repository of architectural and geological recordings as written, drawn, and built elements. A kind of reverse architecture where we use three-dimensional laser scanning technology to extract traditional architectural information of the caves. This information is then used to curate community meetings where we really collectively discuss a kind of future imaginary that is always open for construction and deconstruction. This information is then etched on leather maps in scaled bronze models narrated in short stories and transposed to different locations. In these varying sites, we convene with diverse indigenous communities to address complex environmental and cultural challenges faced on the continent of Africa and across the planet. Sabra is an Arabic word that means salt flat. It's actually been introduced into the English dictionary. If you look up Sabra in the English dictionary, it will mean salt flat. And Sabras constitute 5% of the UAE geography or landscape, and they fall under the category of wetlands. These are living environments that you find mostly along the coast of the UAE. The UAE is home to some of the most intact Sabras in the world. They're also very old. This sabkha we're standing on is probably 300 to 400 years old. A sabkha is a living environment. Every time we come out to this site, it's different. And these are always also changing within the landscape. A sabkha cannot be defined with a very clear geographic border. The border is always shifting. It's related to water and water is always moving. It's a fluid element. Sometimes it's flooded with more water, sometimes it's drier. It keeps changing. A sabkha is composed of five different layers. One of the layers is a microbial mat. Once you look closer here, you can see the algae growing within it. Also within this microbial mat, you have many living organisms. So they're living environments with a lot of species living in them, really tiny kinds of different species, which I'm really interested to know more about. So this is part of our research is also talking with these environmental agencies to help us understand more and, you know, dig deeper into what sabkhas are, what's the life in sabkhas. Sabkhas can sequester CO2. They are carbon sinks, just like our oceans and seas. So we should preserve them. They provide balance to our environment. What's interesting to note is that sabkhas are great grounds for the mangroves because mangroves eat salt, so they live on salt. So the sabkha sites are also, although they have the connotation of, you know, no vegetation, in fact, if you grow certain types of mangroves, they would flourish in sabkhas. Then you can create this microclimate where, you know, the, the mangrove will also bring in birds and this and that, and then you have a microclimate going on. One of the aims in our research is to help preserve sabkhas and help promote their conservation. What we are doing is analyzing the crystallization process in sabkhas and learning from that, and learning from the minerals present in sabkhas. Snow in the desert. That has taught us much in our research and experiments with the residual brine of desalination water. In this desert environment, there is no fresh water except uh, desal water and the UAE is the third largest desalinator in the world. The number one is KSA, number two is USA and the amount of reject brine that is produced by the desalination process is equivalent to 4,800 
Olympic size swimming pools daily that are being dumped into the Arabian Gulf. You're having this highly saline reject brine material that's daily being thrown back into the sea. So what's happening is that the life in the Gulf is dying and the Gulf is becoming this large battery because what's a battery? It's salt and water. So it's a large battery that stores energy. It's also adding to climate change and the rising of temperatures in the region. So there's a lot that goes with this industrial process. And that actually has a lot of problems that we are addressing in this project and in this exhibition. To access the desalination plants, you need road infrastructure, you know. So you have roads, networks that start to cut into the subhas, and also you need to get power to these desalination plants. So you have these huge power grids that are going in, and then you start excavating in the subhas to create the footings for these huge things. So there's this struggle, the struggle between nature and infrastructure, between nature and modernity. In order to build, you need this infrastructure. And they are actually occupying most of the subha size along the coastal front. Here you can see the power grid above me and the, the natural spa below me and the tension between the natural and the modern. So our interest in this research is really trying to see if this reject brine could be used as an architectural material. You know, concrete is actually formed from minerals, so it's kind of the same line of thinking. We have this highly rich mineral solution. Could this rich mineral solution become an architecture? The first experiment was a very basic and innocent experiment. So we had the reject brine, and then what we did was try to see how we can grow crystals, because crystals create structures and that will produce architecture. We simply started by submerging fabrics into the highly saline reject brine solution, and these fabrics will crystallize with time, and this creates different structures of different forms. The problem of these experiments is that we soon realized these are soluble structures, these are not insoluble structures, which means that they absorb humidity, and if it rains, they will collapse. There's a beauty in that, that they go back to nature. But at the end of the day, our intent is to produce a material that's a true contender to Portland cement, knowing that Portland cement is an environmentally disastrous material. It's responsible for 8% of global CO2 emissions. The problem of Portland cement is uh, the conversion of limestone, which is CaCO3, to CaO. To produce one ton of cement, you emit one ton of CO2. And to absorb one ton of CO2, you need one tree for 40 years to absorb that. So the material itself is extremely eco-unfriendly. We really wanted to try to push our research further. We wanted to move the experiments from innocent structures being created in an architectural office to real research in creating an alternative to Portland cement. What we did is we partnered up with NYU Abu Dhabi Amber Lab, which is an advanced material research laboratories. And what they could do is that they um, were able to extract MGO, which is a salt or a mineral found in the reject brine, and use that as a replacement to CAO, which is the problem of uh, the CO2 emission in Portland cement. And we were able to produce these insoluble blocks it is a great material, but still the research is too early. The beauty of this material is that it absorbs CO2, but there's not enough CO2 in the atmosphere today for it to gain its strength. This material, we are able to produce it only as precast structures. Once we produced, you know, this MGO cement block, we wanted to also experiment with not only a structural material, but also with finishes and different uh, materials that can be used uh, as applications to wall finishes, floor finishes, etc. It brings back the locality or the place into the building itself where, you know, I think Portland cement at some point became so universal and so, so standardized that the sense of locality or geography kind of completely di disappeared from architecture. It's kind of very much talking about the locality of the UAE and its geography and its landscapes. And that is an ode to, you know, looking back again into the UAE 
uh, ground and earth. And these are all the soils gathered from different parts within the UAE. Today, I'm very confident we can build a house of two story from precast units and we can use MGO, this MGO cement in, in achieving that. It's not at all difficult. There is a lot to learn from our precedents and that was important for us to learn. We went back and tried to see if anyone had actually built architecture out of sabkhas and tried to study the vernacular, if it was ever a vernacular material. And we found out that a town on the border of Libya and Egypt called Siwa was built out from Sabha bricks. It's a very simple process. So what they found in nature, in their environment, were crystal blocks of Sabhas. So what they did is layered these blocks on top of one another and used the Sabha mud as the binder. So they would crystallize all together and become a rigid structure. Uh, still some hotels there operating are built from sabha blocks and uh, quite healthy because you know salt is a very good material for asthma and anything related to i think lungs and, and it purifies the air so in a way it's promoted as a healthy spa environment in that aspect you know there's a lot to learn always from our ancestors and from vernacular architecture and makes us re-question our modern ways of building. It's these industries that just become too imposing on the market, on the developers, on the architects. And we need to reset and re-question and answer the question that Hashem Sarkis raised for the Biennale, how will we live together? And the we in this exhibition is purely us as humans and the planet or the environment. And this is how can we coexist? And we can coexist by trying to help our planet rather than deplete its resources and create emissions and all these environmental impacts. For Venice, actually, we are interested in uh, going back to our previous experiments with the different minerals and sands that we found in the UAE and uh, trying to actually achieve a crystal growth as a final finish to the prototype. Again, it will be a living structure similar to the Safra, a living environment. So it will probably grow crystals with time or degrade and just collapse. It depends on the weather and the humidity. So it's going to be interesting to see the reaction of the structure with the actual environment in Venice. We're building a prototype using the MGO cement. These are soil molds that we are using to cast the modules that will build the prototype in Venice. You know, as I said earlier, we need to go back to vernacular in a way to re-question our way moving forward to create something that is more in tune and in harmony with nature and the earth. It's an antithesis kind of approach to modern architecture. So uh, we're using these soil uh, uh, say uh, pods in which we uh, draw the forms or the modules in which we cast then the MGO cement to uh, create the interlocking modules that will create the final structure in Venice. The shapes are inspired from the uh, coral houses, the vernacular architecture of the UAE. So each person's understanding of what a coral looks like would be drawn into the sand, into the soil actually and then these are cast into them. We've built so many prototypes that we've kind of, it's a learning exercise of, you know, which interlock with which in a better way, what's the best scale. The outcome of the architecture is always different depending on the person. It's a communal approach. It's a way of going back and re-questioning our systems and what, you know, the modern way or the modern architecture, where has it taken us and do we need to change? And if not, okay, what will constitute the 21st century architecture? It's a huge question. We are obliged to answer and we as architects are responsible to answer.
pues los mayas, pues los actuales, pues somos nosotros, ¿no? Solo que pues ahorita pues nos enfrentamos a otras, a otras situaciones diferentes a las que se enfrentaban, por ejemplo, los que esclavizaban con el Niquén. Piensan que pues, los mayas son como los de las películas, ¿no? Que tienen sus taparrabos y así sin camisa y todo, ¿no? Y están construyendo pirámides. Pero pues no, pues somos todos los que estamos acá ahora. Me gusta estar acá porque es una casa fresca para el calor. No sientes, no sientes calor, está fresco para la casita cuando tú entres. Pues a mí me significa esta casa pues por, los, por las generaciones que me lo vienen dejando. Desde que empezaron mis abuelitos, que me lo que los veo manteniendo. Yo no sé qué esfuerzo hicieron para obtenerlo y me daría mucha pena tirarlo, porque no sé con qué, con qué, con qué sacrificio lo hicieron. Y por ellos yo, yo lo sigo manteniendo y lo disfruto con mi familia. Son poquitas. Sí, ya se pobló, pero de ya este, de, de concreto. Si no por el gobierno tuviésemos todavía piso natural uh -huh. de tierra, uh -huh. que ya es cuando el gobierno empezó a dar apoyos a, los, a la gente marginada. Lo que se viene viendo, que el piso natural está mejor y el techo de guano está mejor. En el piso natural y el techo de guano no necesitas clima, no lo uh -huh. tiene por natural. Tienes pared de material y techo de material, pues lógico, es un horno ahí adentro. ¿Ya no hay madera para hacerla? Sí hay, pero el gobierno ya te pone muchísimas, muchas trabas. Si te encuentras tirando un árbol es como si estuvieras vendiendo este marihuana. Es mucho delito. Que dices, a lo mejor, este, quiero hacer mi casa, pero a lo mejor nada más te dan este permiso de derribar un árbol. Y con un árbol no, no vas a hacer una casa de esto. Estamos pues, en, en una búsqueda de una nueva relación con el Estado. O sea, primero somos pueblo, primero somos mayas y después tus leyes, a ver cómo las acomodamos dentro de lo que viene siendo el orden natural del pueblo maya. Nosotros, eh, este, como pueblos originarios, sabemos que el derecho nos asiste a ser nosotros mismos quienes decidamos las formas de cómo queremos nosotros vivir. Claro, siempre, siempre dentro del respeto a los derechos humanos. Pero además de nosotros está todo el hábitat natural. En maya decimos Kash Uyalak Kash, el monte y todo lo que vive, la vida del monte. Y todo eso también tenemos que cuidarlo. Y claro, los pueblos decimos, urge el derecho a la libre autodeterminación, porque solo así podemos frenar que se sigan metiendo en nuestras casas sin pedirnos permiso. Su clasco si cuay y solare, su amontonar que, que a que un peluquinile, pues mi cupi su lugar y, o de tres metros su llame, o como de cuatro metros su choquile, y luego su paque o como, 
kutsi ke balulo le chenzo kutsi ke balulo kutsi kutanche i le chenzo kutsi kutanche i lo ko lutsi ke tune wing ke chia tumene le shantie ya nuwa kun ke tiserao e chenu wa kun te tiserao pero ba se yo ke yo ke yo ke balulo ti ani Hele kuwa tatung be tisera tuna be yanila e chenta ke ho na tuno ti tuku kapli pa anto be ulam pete la be shinu lam pete la santu wa la ke ho na be ya kak asikuolis e kak asikuolis e be ya de wolis ya anto na kak askula kopche ki ala le kopche e ma ya ki ala le kopche ya na kak asik tak ka ka sit yo su Chanchi kumuk, chank ashe chawi ke chembe tohta kila. Después tu ne kolu kola yete sum, kola yete sum tu ne tu binu wolis ta beya. Ha, te tu ne kuchab lupi se kila le oma chta noch wolis, oma chta noch beya. Wata noch e kolu binu chamasti bikunta. E che ilak tu ti bile, pos be tu kumpat lo. Echen toh kulah meta tun beyo kutsa watun kulubi lo ibi she beya kulub te lo ti anu he kulubi kolupak lulami komo 15 o 16 kulubo tu ba sutu mi dia 30 wa 40 sha ku milu so ko tunu tsa lu kulubi lo bo ku ka sha sha ne kopche he yan tu pacha ibi she beya ki ala le kopche tanto be te la be te lo ti u be tu Ucui cetta, te tu no, in bisi la, perché in casa uci è te ac, ha, wak, wak, uci ac, ma uci puro ac, e ma ia sobo puro ac, però le ac, cavica, e ora è come ti quarenta, cinquenta anni, o sette anni. In questo caso, le persone che hanno visto il uccello, il uccello e il balmino, le persone che hanno visto il uccello, 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 le persone che hanno visto il Saya ingin hujan selat, tu mene lela. Ucapan abu lo lebukan semata ono. Upe lugar sagrado, wajeh cile. I wajeh pusingnya persona indikado pati joklo obo. Tu mungkin kat kimi uiti orang ini papa sana. Banyak lor lak obok joklo. Kak 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 tu nema. Le joklo obo eti persona ku kutsah ko gente. Upe hierba tero, upe curan tero, entonces yo lo, yo la lo, le voy a chile o no, ve ya, pues upe, upe hay, upe es lugar sagrado, tío. Sagrado y catingo, vale, tú me voy a, pues, 
tranquilo da yam tu lak le balo yo pues hoy cuche con sabiduría le hierba tero bo entonces yo le lo pues le tío ve voy tu pez o no ta pues va u cuche el tosco u beco oraciones Yo tengo un sueño que a lo mejor yo no lo voy a ver, o a lo mejor sí, que más adelante ya podamos tener nuestro propio gobierno nosotros, que nosotros podamos decidir ya. por nosotros mismos, ¿no? que ya los partidos políticos, el gobierno, pues que ya no, no se metan con nosotros, que nos dejen vivir tranquilos como estamos. Creo que no, no nos haría falta ¿no? que nos dejen vivir así. Ese es mi sueño, ojalá que algún día lo vea que haya un consejo, que todos podamos decidir en asambleas lo que se va a hacer y lo que no se va a hacer acá. Hey, uh, greetings from Stockholm, from Sweden. Uh, my name is Carlos Minguez Carrasco. I'm the head curator at Artes, the Swedish National Center for Architecture and Design. I'm here, right in front of the museum building, in a very, very cold uh, but beautiful day in Stockholm. I'm here to talk to you about Kiruna. Kiruna is a city in the Arctic Circle in Sweden. Kiruna is experiencing today one of the most important urban transformation projects in recent history. The city is being relocated, is being moved by three kilometers due to the expansion of the mine uh, that grows below it. The city of Kiruna was officially founded in 1900 as an industrial settlement that was built on the site of an iron ore body that proved to be very pure and very profitable. 120 years later, that industrial settlement has become the biggest underground iron ore mine in the world, exporting thousands of tons of iron per year and exporting nationally and internationally. The mine has grown so much, is extracting at such a deep level that has jeopardized the foundation of the city of Kiruna, forcing the city to be relocated. Even though the project was started in 2004, it is today when we start to see the consequences of the relocation of the city. A third of the population needs to leave their homes. Housing blocks and heritage buildings are being demolished or moved. And an entire new city centre is being built as we speak. All of this happening in a land that has been inhabited for millennia by the indigenous population of the region, the Sami. Ardes, acknowledging such an important and, and, and complex project, has organized an exhibition. The exhibition is titled Kiruna Forever and precisely deals with the relocation, trying to understand what does it mean to move a city and what are the complexities and the different angles that have, are at play in such a relocation. The exhibition gathers more than 100 works by artists, architects, urbanists, journalists, photographers that look at the relocation. And, and tries to provide a historical and geographical context to the ongoing project. The exhibition traces back to, goes back to the first documentations that we could find of the city of Kiruna. In the exhibition, we included a document, a drawing by Isaias Hexel, that is the result of a geological expedition that was commissioned by the Swedish Crown in 1736. Um, the drawing represents a mountain that is Kirunavara, the mountain where the mine is located today in Kiruna, and represents the mountain with a gray zone in the middle. That gray zone indicates that there is iron in there. So from the very first representation that we know of, of the Mount Kiruna, already the idea of resources, the, the, the fact that iron was there, was one of the most important aspects. And that drawing is one of the first steps done by the Swedish crown 
to analyze, control, claim, um, exploit and urbanize the northern lands of the Scandinavian Peninsula and initiates the extractive project that led to the ongoing relocation of the city of Kiruna. In this context, the exhibition tries to respond to the big questions that such a complex project arises. What is the limit of natural resources? Until which level are we going to keep on digging? And what is the impact of that decision? And what happens to the identity of the citizens that need to leave their homes where they have been raised? But also, what is the negotiation with Sami community in relation to questions of sovereignty and land ownership? In this context, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, art desk, and, and in collaboration with uh, Nord, the art museum in Kiruna, has commissioned uh, to five architects and five teams uh, to imagine, to think of uh, alternative visions for Kiruna and for the future of the Nordic region. One of those architects is Joar Nango, who I'm thrilled to be introducing to you today. Joar, uh, is one of the few Sami that are officially graduated as an architect from a school of architecture. Um, he works as an architect, as an artist sometimes, uh, as a designer, as a community builder. But for me, one of the most important roles of, of Joar Nango's work is that he's the most important spokesperson for the understanding of what is the role of Sami architecture in today's world. Girje Gumpi uh, is one of the long-term projects from Joar Nango a mobile Sami architecture library with more than 200 titles addressing questions of indigeneity, questions of indigenous architecture, resistance and um, decolonization. The mobile Sami architecture library moves, uh, travels to different locations and hosts conversations, workshops and events uh, addressing uh, like, uh, Sami architecture tools, materials, but also agency. For today's presentation for the world around, Joar Nango, in collaboration with Arcdes, will be presenting uh, the digital manifestation of the Sami Architecture Library. We are excited, excited to launch, uh, for the first time since Joar Nango started to work with it, a digital version, a digital face of the Sami Architecture Library, a digital face of the Girje Gumpi. In the, in, the, in the digital version that will be available from today online uh, for free for everybody, to check, um, you, could, you could find images, uh, texts, articles, uh, artworks, uh, drawings, music, three-dimensional representations, uh, and yet uh, the, the project is yet another iteration uh, of the Girje Gumpi, this time understanding the web as a place of encounter, as a place of, of connection, of learning, of uh, solidarity. I believe Joar Nango's work is of utmost importance uh, for architectural world today. Uh, his practice reminds us of the importance of the relationship with the land, with nature, but also with the resources. His practice that is in fact a collaborative practice is he's constantly changing and muting like the way he collaborates with different people is a, is a great example of how to practice architecture today in a world in um, constant and radical uh, uh, instabilities. I'm going to leave you with Joar now that he's connecting with us from the north of Norway. If you want to know more about Art Kiruna Forever, please check ArcDesk website, but also you can check the catalog that we publish for the occasion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to leave you with Joar. Joar, the screen is yours. Hi, uh, my name is Yuar Nango. I am an architect, educated architect, working with uh, both visual art and architecture. Um, I'm Sami, uh, living in Tromsø in the north of Norway, or in Sápmi, as we call our territories. Um, at the moment, I'm in my studio in Tromsø uh, at the Teko F Lofte. It's, an, uh, it's a shared studio space I share with four other Sami artists here in town. My field of interest has, since I was a student, been focusing around Sami and indigenous architecture. Uh, for me as a student, I uh, realized very fast that there was very little work done on this in a contemporary scale. Most of the uh, material I found on Sami and indigenous architecture had this kind of folkloristic sort of perspective to it. Um, 
thinking uh, or presenting it as something historical and something with um, something which which to me uh, felt wrong since uh, the Sami culture uh, in which I was raised is uh, strongly alive in my opinion uh, I wanted to do something with that so since my study times I've been making different projects which are kind of like platforms for discussing developing critically thought crit and critically thinking about indigenous and Sami architecture for this presentation uh, I want to show you a project called Giri Gumpi, also known as the Sami Architectural Library. Uh, it has the web address gumpi.space. Easy to remember. Uh, <clears throat> since my study times, already 15 years ago, uh, I was uh, looking a lot at Sami and in indigenous architecture, and I was gathering a lot of material. It was done a very little research on this, so I had to really dig in, dig in a lot of different historical sources and also contemporary magazines uh, to gather all the material that was available. Uh, and slowly, slowly over the years, I built some kind of a, I say, I would say, an archive of uh, of uh, of Sami architectural sources, sources that were taken from historical books, ethnographic sources but also more critically and contemporary theory around architecture and philosophy that I felt was relevant for a discourse concerning minority rights, land, indigenous land rights, uh, decolonization, queer feminist theory, uh, things that I sort of saw as uh, inspirational for a discussion about Sami architecture. The library is built uh, in a gumpi. A gumpi is a reindeer herder's hut. It is a fantastic small little um, typology of vernacular Sami architecture that is used by the reindeer herders when they move with their uh, reindeer herds from the winter grazing land to the coastal summer area. Um, and it's a place to, it's a mobile home uh, used for this spring migration. Uh, that is usually self-made and it comes in hundred different forms and shapes uh, and here's some images of them. It's an ongoing research archive that I'm doing where I also uh, interview and collaborate with different builders on you know sort of creating a, uh, some reflex reflections around this beautiful typology. Um, I'm also making a f film about the Gumpi, which will be released next year. Um, the, the construction of the Giri Gumpi uh, started in uh, Hoshta, which is a small community south of Tromsø, where I live, where they every year uh, are, are organizing uh, what's called the Festbildne in Hoshta. Uh, and um, for that uh, project, I sort of invited a lot of different uh, builders and designers, craftsmen and Sami architects to come there and to sort of partake in the creation of this library structure itself. And here you see some images from that. Uh, we held a whole day seminar about Sami architect architecture where we invited different uh, designers and architects that have been involved in working with the Sami architectural, um, uh, I guess, landscapes. So there's, uh, of course, a few buildings that are designed for the Sami community, but uh, absolutely none of these are designed by Sami architects. Um, they're designed by outsiders. So um, it was interesting for us to, to sort of, uh, for a whole day, question each other about some, and sort of share our different perspectives on Sami architecture. And we had a very educative day. You will also, on this uh, web page, uh, be able to find um, four hour long video documentation of that uh, seminar itself. Um, yeah, we were also, as I said, uh, gathering all the eight Sami architects that uh, exist. Uh, and uh, it was a really powerful sort of moment to start to develop this sort of autonomous 
indigenous grounded uh, platform for architectural discourse and thinking. And I think that's really needed. I think we as indigenous people, we really need this type of autonomous platform where we can d discuss self-representation through architecture, where we can also, you know, meet each other uh, on an eye to eye sort of level. Uh, without necessarily always dealing with the sort of us and them conflicts uh, and sort of uh, challenges that we are so often um, exposed to when we work with architecture and indigenous representation. Um, <clears throat> one of the, I, I guess, very interesting things we discussed during that seminar that I've also been talking about and other scholars like Elin Haugdal, which is a professor of architectural history here in my hometown and also Sunne Vaskolnes, which is also an architect who's been working extensively on Sami architecture. Um, what they've been talking about and what we also talked about at this seminar was um, was that sort of the, the, the high amount of buildings designed for Sami community that use the traditional lavu uh, which is our tent, traditional tent used by the nomadic reindeer herders moving with the herds in the mountain areas. It is very much similar in uh, aesthetic way to the teepee from North America, which are more, I guess, famous and more people know about. But, but the lavo is also, it's also a very recognizable, you know, type of geometrical form that stands out in the landscape. And it's, it's really connected as a very unique sort of architectural typology to, to the Sami culture. And when, what, what the architects have done when they have you know, been sort of offered the opportunity to design for Sami community is of course to, to get you know, started by looking at sort of what's culturally significant in the architecture of this culture. And, uh, and there, there's a lot of um, uh, examples which, in which you can see that the architects of course have landed on the most obvious and sort of fascinating shape, which is the, the lavu. And, they have used this uh, traditional tent, the lavu, as a geometrical starting point and a reference point for an architecture, which um, which uh, yeah, which which connects the architecture to Sami culture. It makes it Sami arch architecture. And I think that when you start, when I started looking at this, I I, re I realized that there were quite a lot of these, and it was almost like all of these. Uh, architects, non-Sami architects designing for our community were doing the same thing. They were taking this very sort of exotifying symbol of our culture and putting that into an otherwise quite conventional type of architecture. And I started to sort of maybe <laughs> wanting, I wanted to criticize and I wanted to create some sort of reflection around why it is like this. I wanted the Sami community itself to you know, question what kind of architecture do we need? How do we represent ourselves best? But also trying to sort of create an awareness amongst architects uh, designing for us um, that you know our culture might actually have a lot more to offer, a stronger sort of spatial concepts, or you know maybe there's material cultural aspects, or maybe the landscape itself and our relation to the landscape can sort of uh, be used as some sort of a starting point for an architecture and a design and. I think it's I think it's very limiting to see how how this um, uh, how how the how so many architects were doing the same and I just coined the phrase the giant level syndrome. Um, expanding on that, I also made a selection of sweaters that are based on uh, images I took from these um, from these buildings and I made the knitting pattern with 10 different colors and I traveled back to these villages where these giant lavos are existing in the Sami community and uh, and I I was uh, and I and I asked uh, knitters to knit a selection of sweaters there's now six sweaters in this series and it keeps growing it's been exhibited in many different exhibitions um, internationally uh, so critically thinking about architecture representation, it brought me to to the question: What what is Sami architecture? What 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 could you sort of really really define as something Sami? And and maybe maybe it's interesting to sort of try and look a little bit beyond the the visual aesthetics or the idea of representation representation through form. Uh, 
um, and maybe look more at some sort of an attitude uh, or or an, a way of thinking more than a way of uh, uh, shaping and forming. So, so what I found uh, and what I sort of been talking quite a lot about is what I like to call the indigenuity or the Sami competence of improvisation, which is a, a distinct sort of attitude which uh, in which um, Sami Samis are you know uh, in sort of um, an very immediate do it yourself I can fix it type of way creating and designing solving problems on the land when problems or challenges occur um, and I've been gathering photos of this I made a project together with another Sami designer and, and artist called uh, Celia Figenskjaer-Turesen called the Indigenuity Project uh, and here are some of the images that we've been gathering sort of we traveled around documenting this type of phenomenon, the indigenuity. Uh, indigenuity, of course, being some kind of a, a word play on indigeneity and ingenuity and this sort of indigenous ingenuity that you find on the land. Here you see an image, for example, of my father's life, be life west, uh, which he makes when he goes uh, on the river with my aunt on a boat. Uh, he has some old water cans and some wood can um, wood firewood holders not knitted together as a, some sort of a emergency uh, floating device um, yeah here's an example of a post box stand here's a um, scarecrow made from an old bottle this is an interesting example uh, also from the northern parts of Nunavut, which is a sort of a small seal oil lamp made from an, an old discarded frying pan. This is, um, this is an interesting example of um, actually a, an old refrigerator remade into a small smokehouse. Uh, these two chambered refrigerators were in this village on the Finnish side of Sapmi, which we visited really high on demand when they were when they were broken because they had these two chambers and you could put the sort of the smoking source in one chamber and then because of the insulation you would sort of uh, be able to cold smoke the um, fish or the meat on the uh, putting that in the other chamber very practical and interesting um, design which is sort of also becoming typologies people are coping each other and and solving this uh, issues as they go. Some things are also really, really cultural specific, like this uh, part of a log, which you see here is, uh, it's actually, um, it's a device, a tool used for smashing and beating shoe grass. Shoe grass is traditionally used in the reindeer herding, or sorry, the, the reindeer fur uh, shoes. Uh, and, um, and this, this tool is used to sort of uh, smash the, the the grass on it and to make it soft um, and this is of course something you cannot go to the hardware store and buy uh, it's something you really got to uh, make yourself um, so there's also something about that cycle of things I also really love it when you see this sort of uh, very west Western commercial type of uh, products re sort of programmed or repurposed reappropriated you could even say into you know culturally specific use like for example uh, our we have this traditional sami big knives which we which we um, uh, sometimes can de-rust using coca-cola because coca-cola actually etches steel uh, because of the acidity of it so uh, this is something uh, i find quite interesting in a way in a cultural way that there's this sort of almost like this element of cultural resistance uh, within this um, immediate indigenuity and way of sort of uh, acting self-sufficiently uh, on the land. Maybe most important is the, is the examples of, um, of Dwoji experiments. I've been sort of parallel to, to, uh, to working with uh, exposing the books, creating a library, which is social, which people can come and visit. I've also been thinking that it's important to somehow include the traditional knowledge, which is also in so many ways 
an important part of sharing and thinking about design and architecture is it's all the knowledge that exists within the craft itself and and in in Sami culture we have um, a, an old term for our craft which is called duji and and duji is maybe in my point of view the most sort of autonomous specifically Sami cultural skill set that we actually have and I so therefore I thought that as a part of the Giri Gumpi and the building of this small scale Sami architectural library I thought it would be nice to also develop an interior that could be somehow um, uh, uniquely developed and experimentally sort of playing around with some of these uh, traditions that we have uh, and expose them as traditions but also try and renew them in a way and use that use the space as some sort of an open-ended uh, format where we can really investigate and renew in an innovative way our tradition. And um, one of the people I collaborated with for that was Katarina Spikskum, which you see an image of here. She's an amazing doyar who's been sewing a bed, curtains, uh, sleeping sets, and also here you see her making a sleeping bag of reindeer fur. We also invited the amazing painter Anders Sunna a Sami activist and painter who uh, talks a lot about reindeer herding and the sort of colonial behavior of the Swedish state and how his family has been forced out of their traditional herding grazing lands. Um, and I invited him to come and paint a big fresque, uh, like a, a roof painting in the structure. Uh, it's an ongoing project, so when I've been traveling with the Gide Gumpi to different locations, Anders quite often comes along and he continues the painting. So it sort of shapes itself uh, following the movement of the structure. Mm, Katarina, the doyar, who's making the interior, is also, has also been par partaking in different sort of chapters of, of the Gide Gumpi's journey. Continuing this conversation about what Sami architecture is, the website uh, and the Giri Gumpi, the archive itself, con contains a lot of different sort of um, photo materials. For example, this photo series, which is from, uh, it's partially from Newfoundland and partially from Greenland, where I've traveled uh, and also looked at other um, uh, DIY traditions that are culturally specific. The, these are, this is a series of images of roadside gardens which is a very interesting phenomenon on the very, very north tip of Newfoundland where the soil is not that fertile or deep, but when they built the highway to St. Anthony up the north, they uh, actually turned over so much soil that actually in the ditches along the road, the most fertile and sort of deepest type of earth exists. And it's a perfect for growing potatoes and cabbage. And, and a lot of this sort of informal, not really legally, um, organized type of gardens are made uh, along the roadside and of course I found them very aesthetically interesting to observe because all of these were built from really you know a lot of discarded material whatever was at hand um, and there were quite <laughs> a lot of similarities to these these structure which you see here which are the dog structures of um, uh, northern Greenland where you know people that are doing dog hunting are are also having to build their sort of small makeshift informal type of structures to to hold the dogs and the dog food and the tools they are used for dog sledding during the summer specifically uh, i find them very really interesting and in some sort of aesthetical expressions of uh, mater this material and flow and what sort of materials are accessible what are sort of cheap and and handy and also uh, there's also some kind of a freedom in the way they're exp they're expressing themselves as spaces. Uh, also on the website I have uh, some text that I've written. There's also uh, my my magus the fan scenes called Sami Huxendala, which was I guess where everything started for me. They're already 12, 13, 14 years old. Um, they are there, it's a project called Sami Huxendaida, which means the Sami art of building, and and it's a magazine that I made as a as a diploma student of architecture in Trondheim and at NTNU, where I uh, was mapping the indigenous architecture and Sami architecture uh, and creating these small magazines that came out in four issues. 
uh, during the years between 2007 and 2009. You can access them and have a look at them. There's also um, other texts that are newer and also texts that I sort of acquired elsewhere. Um, there's also a possibility to watch my uh, uh, latest production, which is called the Post-Capitalist Architecture TV Show, which comes in three parts. And they're all available here um, on the on the virtual uh, library of Sami architecture, the Giri Gumpi. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, I want to end the presentation here. And I really hope you have uh, time to come and visit uh, the website. It's not going to be up for ever. We have decided to make it a temporary project. So for a three months period, I think it is. Uh, you'll be able to log on to gumpi.space and flip through all the sources, the texts, the image archives, and of course, uh, also find inspiration in the, all the books that we also sort of took photos of and presented here. Um, yeah, thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to session two town hall. Uh, we're starting the town hall uh, with a, a Q&A with Samaya Valley from uh, the CEO and founder of Counterspace. Um, we're gonna talk for a little bit and then we're gonna invite the rest of the participants. So please feel free to get your questions um, lined up. Um, first of all, Samaya, thank you so much for joining us. Um, can, you, um, can you tell me where, where are you this e where are you this evening? I guess it is evening time where you are um i'm in johannesburg this evening as i've been for most of the year <laughs> last year yeah we had a conversation um earlier i guess it was like kind of middle end of last year um because we wanted you to be part of the whole world around experience which we're doing it in residency at the guggenheim um, and we're going to be working together on a film that will come out um, in maybe a month's time from now. Um, can you talk a little bit about or introduce uh, the concept of that film for us? Yeah, I'm really excited to be working on this film with you, Beatrice, and I'm so honored that you asked me. I'm such a fan of you and your work, and I also think that the residency that you're working on is so beautiful. Um, the film is called Umklava, which translates to world, and I thought that that was also a nice link to the world around, but it's also a term that's interchangeably used for land, for soil, for ground, um, for estate, territory, so it's a word that's used for, um, you know, staking a claim to land. And um, what we're trying to do with the film is to weave in and out of different scales from the scale of dust to the kind of macro scale of the planet, um, thinking through um, our relationships to land, but also how territories are entangled and bound. Um, and I was really inspired by um, uh, lots of South African poets and poets mm -hmm. from elsewhere as well. And the script is inspired by poetry from Sibukasi Jonas, from Don Matera, Gloria Anzaldúa, and then it's tied together with recipes from Johannesburg and by extension from across the continent. And I think that those really speak to um, the movement of people and the traditions that we carry within the land and um, how we are connected to earth and to land by soil, by nutrients, by breath as well. I really like the, the way that you speak about it because I feel like we're talking, we sort of constantly move between talking about something physical and talking about something metaphorical and that you're kind of moving between this idea of the earth as something that contains more than it, that the sum of its parts, right? That you tell stories by looking into the microbial details of soil um, and you're like interrogating really the meaning um, and trying to read into these materials that you're investigating, these elements that you're, that you're un unraveling for us. Um, your one of the spaces that you that you talked a little bit about was these um, these fields. Could you tell us like one of these examples of elements and and what will be um, what's your reading, for example, of like a car, the car park or uh, one of these or uh, sort of one of the mining uh, expeditions that you were talking about earlier? Yeah, absolutely. So there are many different sites, and I think some some of the um, 
car parks and so on are sites that are appropriated by people or where rituals are performed. Um, and these, I think, are rituals that fall outside of the formal infrastructure of the city. The city hasn't been designed for these rituals. And I'm, I find it really interesting um, to think about architecture in places that are often overlooked. And the mine site that we talk about or we look at as well is also um, the damp site. You know, it's the tailings and the waste of, of mines. And um, in those sites, I think there is so much history that is just constantly unfolding because they're being they're eroding at the moment. Um, and there's so much in there from, you know, everything from cl climate crises to thinking through um, bodies that were discarded and disposed of without uh, much dignity. And, you know, mm. literally it is history that's rising to the surface and that's being uncovered undocumented things that we don't know about our city and that have no um, no other record. Um, and I think that this is a really interesting reflection, like many of the reflections that we saw in this wonderful program today on, uh, you know, our connections to land and earth and how we can think through architecture in places that have been excluded for such a long time from the canon and from the discourse. Yeah, I think one of the interesting points that has, has definitely come up throughout this session and the previous one is the, the more lateral approach that many architects, specifically your generation, are taking a totally different attitude towards building. Um, one that's much more, that really questions the need to build at all. And then every move, every wall that you make is also mm -hmm. almost like a wall that you try to dismantle at mm -hmm. the same time. Um, and I wondered if you could speak to that. How, how do you feel that your generation sees the role of the architect today? Absolutely. I think I definitely believe very much in building. Um, I am an architect who's in love with architecture, very much so. But I also think that um, my hope for my generation, and I think, as you mentioned, we can already see it, we're um, kind of supplementing and expanding our tool set all the time. And I, I certainly am really interested in doing that, especially for um, architects and architecture on the continent. I think it's particularly important because there is so much about our context that is kind of ahead of architecture. Um, I like to think of it that way, that has been excluded from the discipline for such a long time. And I mm -hmm. think that um, we need to find new ways to draw um, that allows us to translate so many of these phenomena, whether that's through working in film or I often work with performance and choreography and drawing from Johannesburg and from the traditions that we have on the continent. I think there is so much in the oral and the oral and so on, but those things don't translate well into the current tools that we have. And um, because those tools are so specific, I think it's really, really important that our arsenal starts to expand laterally, as you're saying, to include um, other ways of being, because I think that that's really going to push the discipline forward. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about image making, I mean, we're working on a film together. You've also worked on other films in the past. How could how does that work? Does that, is that a, a way of thinking for you? Is that a way of designing? How do you see that approach when you look at the city and you walk? We talked a lot about the way that you walk through Johannesburg, the experience of being through the markets, understanding the life cycle of these ingredients, and and the experience of of uh, of like for example eating together around the table. Um, mm. But what is what is this sort of lateral work? This kind of image making and experiencing the city. How does that unfold for you in terms of your your practice? I think it's, um, there's a lot of similarity and I, I guess that this is, is said often um, by architects, but there is, there is so much uh, that parallels between filmmaking and architecture um, in terms of you know, being able to frame things and um, being able to express mood and narrative that I think is, is something that's uh, really important to my practice. Um, but I also think that there's something interesting about using, uh, about exposing and using what is existing. And a lot of the films that you're mentioning work with existing fragments, with archival footage and with news headlines, um, with things from popular culture. And I, I, I really work to juxtapose those things and to put them next to each other to reveal something new. 
Um, and as a designer as well, and I think my, my architecture also strives to do that, as you said, to build walls, but at the same time start to unravel, dismantle, or look deeply inside of them and thicken them in a way. Um, even if I think of the work for the Serpentine Pavilion at the moment, which we also talked extensively about, I think there is some of that thinking that draws together different places and fragments um, from you know, many different territories together as well. So you're um, one of the young, I mean, I guess the youngest uh, studio ever to be commissioned with the Serpentine Pavilion. Um, it's a very prestigious invitation. Um, it was a real, I think a real buzz uh, in our little architecture world to know that you were selected. Um, can you explain a little bit about what your attitude is to this, um, this project where, you know, before pretty much every important architect um, has, has had a kind of a crack at this. So what's your, what's your take and how do you manage with that, um, that legacy of, of this pavilion? Yeah, I mean, I think maybe I don't think too much about the legacy because that is a lot to hold and um, a lot to think about because of course all of them are architects that I've grown up with and admired so deeply. Um, but I think that what was most important for me about this commission and I think as well with our film is to open up my site of practice as a site that includes many different, as many different voices as possible and in a way hands over and passes the baton on to um, many, many other people and to, to make as many people as part of the process as possible. I still very much believe in the agency of the architect as author but I think that um, that can only be deepened and enriched by, or enriched, sorry, by listening deeply to, to place and also to others. Um, and when we talked about making this film as well, we talked about, you know, thinking about a building site or about a site of research, but it, it became really important to me that it also becomes a film that is shared between uh, many different voices and places in the city as well as, as a site of practice. Um, and I think that that also, again, uh, parallels with the, the approach to the pavilion in that I'm really looking to fold the pavilion outside into the city and then fold the city back into the pavilion. And of course, there've been many changes with COVID um, some of them really, I think, changes that will hopefully make it a more meaningful structure for, for all of us. Um, but let's see what happens. So um, what can people expect when they, when they go to the Serpentine uh, over the summer? What will they, what will they, come, what will they confront uh, in Kensington Garden? Um, hopefully um, pieces of the rest of London and its history and its future. I know I'm being um, abstract and a little bit vague, um, but I, I think <laughs> I'm hoping that in the next few months, um, parts of this process also begin to unfold a little bit more publicly. Um, and I, I, I really want to start to, yeah, create this platform and, and um, how do I say, invite people into this world that the pavilion will, will become by the end of the summer. It's so exciting, Samaya, thank you so much. Um, and as someone from London myself, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really hoping to go back and see it um, finally when we all start traveling again. Um, I'm gonna open up this conversation to the rest of the group from the session to Keepers of the World Around. Um, so come, come on in, the rest of the, well, we actually have um, pretty much everybody from session one, um, except Francis Carey, who is traveling right now. So unfortunately he couldn't join us. Um, hi everybody. We're getting questions uh, already from the audience. Um, I'm gonna start with um, a little bit of a question that's related to what Tamaya and I were discussing at the beginning. And in a way that's the thing that unites, I guess, all of these uh, different presentations, which is uh, looking at the rela your relationship as architects to territory. Um, and, you know, we've seen cenotes, we've seen caves, we've seen quarries. Um, 
you know, I think that it, and it's like subcast and so on. So I, I would just really like each of you to just speak to that. Like what's, in a way, what's your relationship as a designer um, to the, the kind of the earth beneath your feet? And, and then maybe if it's easier to answer this with something else is, when did you come to that realization, like in your in your design process, that you have to, um, it's that that the soil beneath you is something that is a design tool and not something to be, let's say, imposed upon, but to work with. Maybe Stella, you could. Um, sorry, Stella, I'm looking at you because you're in the middle of my screen. But um, could you start, Stella, and then we'll go from from person to person. Um, I think one of the things that made Cave Bureau look at that is um, we questioned the museum and what the world sees the traditional museum as. It's, it's a building where you go and you look at artifacts and you learn about the past. But um, we thought of a museum in the African context because a museum um, we have right now is a very westernized um, concept. And what is a museum in, in Africa, for instance? And we thought about our history and um, we came to caves and there's so much history um, in the caves, um, even just around, we've started with caves in Kenya, hopefully we'll expand out of that. But caves have such a rich history, such a rich um, background of what has happened over so many years. And for us, um, we found caves and colonialism were very um, intertwined. We have the Mau Mau fighters that um, fought for the independence um, from the British uh, colonial rule in Kenya. They used caves quite largely as places where they hid, where they left messages for other freedom fighters. Um, and recently, and in what we are showing um, in our video was the Shimoni Caves um, down in the coast, um, in, in the coast of Kenya, along the Indian Ocean, where these caves were used as um, holding caves, so to say, for slaves. Um, before the ships came along the coast and took these um, people that had been enslaved and taken out to the Middle East. So it's just re-looking at um, how can we tell our African history differently without going into a building that has um, artifacts and, you know, things written down for you to, to read and know what happened. How can we then use, yeah, how can we then tell our history our way differently? And we've started with caves and hopefully we'll see where that, um, that leads. And um, Kibage, um, you're, uh, could you tell us, I can't see you right now, but, um, Kabage, could you talk a little bit about your your kind of education a little and and how you came to when you came back? I I know that you studied um, abroad and then you came back to Kenya. Um, can you speak to a little bit of that experience and how you felt um, approaching uh, the land and the soil um, when you came when you returned? Thanks, Beatrice, uh, for inviting us. First of all, it's been a fantastic conference so far. Um, I think what's interesting, just to answer your question, um, where, as you mentioned, yes, we were educated abroad in the UK specifically, and uh, very much of the architectural education really deals with looking at the history, de digging deeper into, into the past. And uh, very often I, I found very, myself very disconnected from that history. And it's only coming back home to Kenya where I sort of felt a bit of a relief to look at our history as something really connected to me. Um, remembering my first <clears throat> most sort of visceral experience of a cave was when I was around 12 years old, we, we camped in Suswa Caves and those memories lived with me for, for a very long time. And you know, the movement into caves was a very natural uh, move. 
uh, which we soon began to find has, has a much deeper uh, connection to our histories. Um, so yeah, that shift was quite interesting actually coming back home, yeah. And, and you are, um, your presentation is a, it's a manifesto in itself, a kind of campaign for visibility and, and more education for, um, for people in Scandinavia to understand the Sami people and the indigenous uh, cultures of building there. Um, also, you mentioned in your education that you, you also came to this conclusion, you know, having gone through a more conventional education system. Um, could you speak a little bit about that process and how you feel about that now? It's been a, <clears throat> it's been a long journey uh, since I, as a student, started to work with these issues of um, indigenous architecture and sort of moving uh, from my own <clears throat> background as a Sami and a member of the indigenous community in Northern Scandinavia. It's been, um, it's been always a focus for me to try and sort of keep the conversation, I guess you could say autonomous in a way, to try and keep the perspectives grounded and try and sort of, so your question about groundedness and where, where, uh, the the earth been how I relate to the earth beneath us. I think that's that's one of uh, the highest importance in a way. Uh, I think um, most of the projects that sort of been involved in uh, or that I have initiated uh, has has taken that point of departure in an almost literal way. Um, I think, for example. Uh, vernacular architecture and sort of learning and analyzing the built environment <clears throat> has been a very sort of important way for me to to connect the conversation about contemporary architecture with my culture. There's quite a few examples of uh, successful translation of the Sami culture into contemporary architecture, especially in an institutional sort of perspective. So uh, so that has been a very sort of important focus for me to really sort of bring it back into the community and bring bring the um, sort of the point of departure or the the um, concepts uh, in, back into the community and the land. And for me personally, I've been very interested in the. Um, sort of the vernacular tradition of improvising and building sort of fast fleeting structures in an Arctic landscape um, and nomadism as a concept for me, uh, contrary to how I think very many modern and I guess you could say Western architects have been dealing with the concept of nomadism as something, you know, a bit generic or something that you find on airports or something that sort of maybe doesn't belong a place. For me, working with the concept of nomadism, nomadism is really the opposite. It's, nomadism is, uh, is the most site-specific form of creating space that exists. Um, and that is for me something that really comes from my culture. And it's, um, it's, uh, it's a way of building, uh, which I see as this sort of uh, very strong, um, philosophy that connects land and human being uh, in a, yeah. And so, so for me, that sort of cultural tradition, that nom nomadic way of building, that way of connecting our ourself to the land, creating simple shelters and creating um, sort of spaces for survival has been uh, like a, a really important point of departure. And then trying to move from, from there on into more contemporary, more sort of large scale projects or whatever, but um, that has been important for me. Thank you so, thank you so much. And thanks for your amazing presentation as well. Um, Wael, it's interesting to hear right, uh, kind of your perspective on the, the idea of the nomad. I, I guess that's also something very, um, that touches on the experience of being in the Middle East and also your, you're also confronted constantly with your relationship with land when you're you're working with the Sabha. Could you speak a little bit um, 
about that and and I remember during your video you were saying that you you were researching um these these houses and these these contexts that use the, that have used the salt as a building material in the past so I wondered if you could uh, dig into that a little bit more for us yeah yeah thank you Beatrice for the lovely symposium I'm really enjoying it and uh, job very well done um, basically, uh, yeah, the subhas of the UAE are this amazing phenomena that, you know, hardly anyone knows about or thinks that these salt flats exist in, in the Gulf, you know. And actually, the UAE subha uh, in 2018 was uh, tentatively listed on the UNESCO World Heritage uh, uh, list of uh, sites. And... Uh, um, uh, so, uh, you know, trying to understand the landscape and the geography in order to connect that with architecture and with culture. And that's, I think, what everyone's talking about. How do we reconnect after, you know, I think uh, feeling the, the, this strong disconnection between architecture uh, that has reached today and culture or, you know, even materiality and sense of place or space. So... Um, um, the, actually, uh, we came across also a, a town on the border of Libya and uh, Egypt called Siwa. And this town is hundreds of years old, around seven, eight hundred years old. And it's actually built from blocks that are extracted from the salt fl flats of uh, Siwa. And uh, it's a vernacular architecture that's been standing up for seven, eight hundred years now. Um, but in our proposal, we do not, uh, you know, we're thinking of it in a different way. We see it more as a future vernacular because we're going to industrial waste as a product rather than promoting the extraction or the use of sabhas. Uh, you know, these are uh, assets that we should uh, preserve, uh, you know, in the environment. So we look at desalination, uh, reject brine as, as a waste material and how how, you know, both are very similar, both contain the same minerals, salts, and how can we transform that to work, you know, as, as uh, uh, Sabha's work in vernacular architecture and, and looking at, at it from that perspective. So we collaborate with a lot of chemistry labs, biochemistry labs. It's a, it's a you know, it's also a huge uh, venture into the, into the technology we have today to help us, you know, uh, re, you know, reconfigure uh, materials that we currently have uh, that are kind of uh, destroying our planet or cities, but, you know, use them in, in upcycling or recycling or in a more proactive uh, way. Mm -hmm. And Deborah, you're, um, I see you're at home up, up there. <laughs> um, what is it? What is that? Uh, your your practice and, and your studio has had um, has been using with, like raw earth as your raw material. Sometimes inverting it, sometimes casting in it. In this in this case, you know you're working with something that's already kind of been cast for you. Um, when did that? When did that start? When did your interest and, and your relationship um, to working with some with the materials of the of the earth come come to you? So it's, uh, I mean, it's interesting that we are presenting uh, in the in your amazing uh, event and show that I, I also enjoyed a lot. Uh, we are presenting one of our latest work where I am now in, in Canterra, uh, the house of the earth that we call, and uh, our spiritual house. And it is an abandoned quarry but um, in our early beginnings as architects, we actually um, arrived to work with uh, the, the earth and with uh, stone by almost by accident or by imposition because we were working in, in Galicia in, in the north of Spain and, uh, and in Santiago de Compostela, which is a historic city and we had to build with granite, the local stone by code, right? So uh, our ignorance on how to work with this material brought us to the quarry, to the places where the material is uh, extracted. And uh, it was such a brutal experience, you know, seeing the land, the transformation of the landscape, 
through the actions of uh, of uh, humans, no, and and especially architects, we are very much responsible uh, for that. Although uh, we ignore it many times because we don't visit quarries enough, no, and the industrial uh, places where we uh, take the materials from, no. So for us, this experience was totally transformative and very inspirational because in the end we actually um, uh, used a lot of the waste material of the quarry because we found incredible value um, in, uh, in the leftovers and incredible beauty in the imperfection in the rawness no? and, and I think this has continued in our practice through the use of very different uh, materials. Uh, again this last uh, work that we are doing is also about um, uh, stone, Mares stone, very different from the granite. Um, and also a very different project because it's it's mostly a discovery that we are doing and, and our, uh, let's say our, our actions as architects is uh, mostly to read, to um, uh, do very little and to kind of highlight the value of what's uh, already there. But, um, um, you know, from the beginning to, um, you know, our latest work, there is this um, great appreciation to land, to landscape, to the resources and how we use it and how we use them uh, and to try to exploit their potential uh, as much as possible. Thank, uh, thank you, Deborah. Um, and Carlos, your exhibition um, couldn't be more connected um, with this, your work with uh, Kieran Eyes. I mean, you, you guys sent me the book. I remember like looking at that, the, the catalog and um, you know, I was like, what's this image of a house on a road <laughs> moving from one place to another? Um, how does, how does this fit into this new relationship with, with that we're talking about now that architects are striving to relate more to the land and striving to be more conscientious, more ecological, um, more respectful. Um, and then things like this happen um, that you're describing in your exhibition. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. Um, like I, I really believe that like soil is one of the key key elements of the of the case study of the city of Kiruna. No, it's like a, um, when we started to really look at the uh, at the project of relocation, um, um, we 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 realized how that image of the house on top of the of a of a truck was actually the image that was more distributed, more presented, basically. Like the media in Sweden was basically portraying what was happening there as a as a success, not as a technological success. We are moving an entire city, but what we uh, like uh, like the at, the at the moment of looking beyond that and to start to understand what are the the complexities of that process, like the reality of it, the the context of the why that city was officially initiated there, um, comes back to the soil. You no, know, comes back to the reason why the industrial settlement was located there was because there was like a there was a Swedish interest in the resources of a land that was inhabited for millennia by the indigenous population of the region, the Sami. And 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 so so like the 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 historical, cultural, and and political context of of the of the relocation traces back to that beginning. That comes back to the to the land to who was like a like inhabiting like that like, like that land and also the way in which that land was treated was um, um, yeah it was like a um, uh, like a war, like inhabited basically yeah and 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 one of the processes of the of the exhibition is been precisely to to try to understand that the soil is mobilized in many different ways in Kiruna yes in the way of extraction because like uh, there is a tons of iron that are extracted daily and, and yearly from from the company, but also is mobilized um, like uh, in many other scales. Is 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 traveling ar ar around the world. Is is getting into the ports and exported to uh, the other side of the of the planet, but also is mobilized in a very clear way in questions of ownership and questions of sovereignty, and 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 that's why like uh, one of the the goals of the project was to try to imagine and to think. Um, differently about the future of that land. There is no current narrative around Kiruna 
that questions the fact that the extraction is, is, is happening, questions the fact that there is a possibility to stop digging if, if, if somebody would think so, right? And that's why it was so important for us to, to invite uh, like uh, architects and, and artists that think differently about that process and how to think different precisely about what is the relationship with nature, what is the relationship with, uh, with land, and, and also what are the possibilities for, for those, um, the, that region that is, that is not the, the narrative that is officially distributed. And that's precisely why uh, we thought of uh, Joan Angos as a fantastic representative of that, because precisely Joan Angos' work allows us to think differently about that land in a, without the stereotypes and really imaginatively. Um, but also very grounded to, to, to his culture um, about what, what are the possibilities of, of working today, of practicing architecture today with these complexities that are present in Kiruna, present in, in the Northern Hemisphere, but, I would, but as we have seen today in the presentations, they are, like a, they are present uh, in many, many different geographies. Mm -hmm. And and so my, I, I'm I'm very interested in the the, the idea of what what Carlos brought up about the politics of digging. What is what does it mean to dig into the soil of of Johannesburg, and what are the the political resonances of that when related to colonialism and and of the extraction that comes with digging? Um, I would be really interested to hear your your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. I think Johannesburg, um, like many conditions that have been described in this town hall session, um, is very much entangled in the politics of land. I think that here in particular, of course, because of our history and because of apartheid, um, land and landscape was also something that was very purposefully um, employed by city planners and by architects as devices to segregate and separate people. Um, and so uh, non-white races lived next to the most toxic areas and it was planned that way. Uh, toxic um, sewage areas, mine tailings and um, wetlands for filtration that were not necessarily the cleanest were, were where um, non-white races were, were living. And the pleasantries of landscape, um, zoos, parks and trees is where uh, white races were located. So I, I think that it's something that is now very much in the subconscious of the city. It's still very segregated, of course, and it's something that we live with every day. Um, and I think that even though race is a question that's very much on the surface and on the agenda of everything, we still, it's, it's still not um, tackled enough or talked about enough. Um, in the architectural conversation and discourse. And, and I certainly see our practice as trying to contribute something to that conversation. Um, in terms of digging, I think, as I said, there's so much in the physical material and matter of land and landscape that speaks about our history. Um, and I think everything from burial grounds to um, looking at and understanding the physical material, you know, in terms of toxic runoffs and so on, really speak about our history and about geographies elsewhere that are benefiting from uh, the wealth that is still underneath our feet, um, to use your phrase. Uh, so I think that's very pertinent to bring to the conversation as well. Um, but I also think that uh, in the everyday rituals of people and you know, in how those are inscribed on the land and landscape through prayer ritual, um, through planting and things, there are also really nuanced relationships to land and landscape that are not all um, so depressing. And I think that also focusing on these smaller and, um, more, you know, these stories that have so much of nuance also bring, uh, they bring to bear another history, um, a history of other kinds of relationships and belief systems around land and landscape. And I think that many of these in particular really start to give us grounds for new kinds of architectures um, and for different relationships to landscape than the ones we, we currently have. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that so many of those 
uh, also speak about a relationship to landscape that is much more situated in something that's poetic and much more situated. It's, it's, it's also about um, seeing ourselves very much as part of the land and the landscape, which I know sounds obvious, but it is in so much more nuanced terms than the language and the lexicon that, that we have in our architectural vocabulary at the moment. Would anyone on the group like to pick up on that or, or um, respond further to any of Tamaya's points? I think I'd, I'd like to add on what she's saying, speaking from an East African context where we dealt with um, colonialism. Um, and the fact that uh, segregation is was really at play and the remnants of it post independence are still there, you know, and um, there are things that are ignored. And uh, as we've sort of discussed in our manifesto, um, the city has the imprints of it throughout and they're they seemingly invisible, but so blatant. So there's a lot of unpacking to think about and, uh, and reflect on, on, on what, what is really our role as architects, designers, how can we really present these, these realities? And, and also with that reality, try to project beyond, beyond the grim, because part of our task is to look at the, the sublime, the beautiful, and, and present uh, a beauty out of, of, of the images we see in the future. And uh, I think just dipping back to some of the Facebook, sorry, the, the um, humans, I just saw someone uh, raise something and she mentioned, she's called Jean. She says, caves bring to mind darkness, sound, and also Plato's world of forms. It's really fascinating she mentioned that because we, we looked at Plato's allegory of the cave and the notion that philosophy was going to pull civilization out of the caves and, and to a sort of new world of enlightenment. And, and some of our, you know, thoughts try to reverse that, to look back into the cave again, philosophically, think about our original state and the things we've lost over the years as humanity in general, and being able to, to unpack that and, and really come together again on, on sort of the table and a, an equal forum, if you'd call it, of discussion and, and, and imaginary, yeah. Yeah, I can uh, second that uh, completely. I think the project of Canterra is a completely irrational one. Uh, everybody asks us, like, who commissioned it? Why are you doing it? Uh, what's it going to become? And we have no answers, except that, uh, as Anton will say, it's, a, it's an act of love. And, and it is, in fact. Uh, but it's also maybe a selfish act because when we come to Canterra and we detach ourselves from uh, the urban, from the things that we fully control, we re-encounter ourselves with um, the very essence, I think, of, uh, of being human. And uh, we become, we feel better architects and, uh, and better human beings in our planet because we are able to live without a lot of the attachments that uh, we live in, in other places. So I, uh, I totally agree with this idea of um, going back to the cave in some, in any possible way, you know, to, to really rethink uh, how we are in the world. I also think, you know, in, 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 the, in, in essence, we are doing very similar is going back, trying to, you know, reassess on how to move forward. And it's, it's all about that, I think. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in 2050, we will be plus 2.1 more billion people on this planet. And how do we, as architects, envision the, sit, the you know, our cities of the future? And what's our responsibility moving forward and you know we know we 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 know the materials we use today are no longer sustainable and you know already they're causing so much in terms of extraction waste pollution to the planet 
So, you know, we have to really go back to learn from, from our ancestors, but at the same time, we cannot really adopt their methods because they, they were only 1 billion people maybe. So, you know, when we will become 10, how, how would that work? And this is where I think we need to rely on the technology that we have today and the science that we have today to help us come up with materials and systems and ways and design methods that, that lets us coexist. And, and we try to answer the question of La Biennale by Hashem, how will we live together? And it is, you know, human and planet or social inequality or all these things that, you know, we are all, you know, discussing today. And, and that is, I think, the, the essence of, of our role as architects today. Well, um... I'm gonna, I think we're gonna kind of run out of time a little bit. Unfortunately, this conversation could go on and on. I hope that we will, as a group or, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, continue it together. Thank you so much for your um, invaluable contributions, for your beautiful films, um, for all of your time um, that you've given to us that I really, really treasure. Um, the next thing that we're going to see is session three, uh, which starts at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and uh, actually, we'll be dealing with these issues, but perhaps on a more political scale. Um, we're looking at um, the U.S. and um, racial justice um, in the U.S., um, starting with Black Space um, and finishing uh, with the Wide Awake. So um, thank you to everyone for joining session two. And we'll see you for session three at four o'clock, uh, Builders of the World Around. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.